Hi everybody and welcome to Tea with Jesus for this week. We are going to be finishing the sixth chapter of Hebrews. And there is a passage in this section of, of verses that has been blessing me as I've been studying it. And I feel like it's one of those places that it'd be good to memorize. It's, it's such a wonderful uh, scripture. So we're, we're going to go ahead and we'll be reading Hebrews 6. And today we'll be finish, finishing the chapter by reading 13 through 20. Now it had just gotten through saying in verse 12. I'll, I'll reread 12 here just so we get the setting to go into verse 13. Then you will not become spiritually dull and indifferent. Instead, you will follow the example of those who are going to inherit God's promises because of their faith and endurance. And then it goes on now in verse 13. For example, there was God's promise to Abraham. Since there was no one greater to swear by, God took an oath in his own name, saying, I will certainly bless you and I will multiply your descendants beyond number. Then Abraham waited patiently, and he received what God had promised. Now when people take an oath, they call on someone greater than themselves to hold them to it. And without any question, that oath is binding. God also bound himself with an oath, so that those who received the promise could be perfectly sure that he would never change his mind. So God has given both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable because it is impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. It leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. Jesus has already gone in there for us. He has become our eternal high priest in the order of Melchizedek. So if we will go back now um, and just look at verses 13 through 15, that's where we're going to start kind of digging back into it again today. So starting in verse 13, for example, there was God's promise to Abraham since there was no one greater to swear by, God took an oath in his own name, saying, I will certainly bless you, and I will multiply your descendants beyond number. Then Abraham waited patiently, and he received what God had promised. And let's go back and kind of look at what this is actually talking about here. Um, God had given Abraham a promise to be the father of, of a great nation, a, a a nation that would bless the rest of the entire world. But he waited for 25 years for that promise to be fulfilled in his life. That's how long Abraham waited. So I want to go to Genesis 12, and I want to read verse 2, and then I want to read verse 7. God's talking to Abram. His name was not changed to Abraham yet. And in verse 2 of chapter 12, he says, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. And then in verse 7, then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I will give this land to your descendants. And Abram built an altar there and dedicated it to the Lord who had appeared to him. So God is giving him a promise of a land and of a great nation. And at this point, you know, Abram had no children. Now let's go to Genesis 13, and we'll read 14 through 17. Now after Lot had gone, the Lord said to Abram, Look as far as you can see in every direction, north, south, east, and west. I am giving all this land as far as you can see to you and your descendants as a permanent possession. And I will give you so many descendants that like the dust of the earth they cannot be counted. Go and walk through the land in every direction, for I am giving it to you. And then we'll go to chapter 15 of Genesis and read 4 through 6. Then the Lord said to him, to Abram, 
No, your servant will not be your heir, for you will have a son of your own who will be your heir. Then the Lord took Abram outside and said to him, Look up into the sky and count the stars if you can. That's how many descendants you will have. And Abram believed the Lord, and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. So he's, he's you know, believing the promise that God is giving him, even though it seems completely impossible at this point. Um, he thought that, that um, one of his actual, one of his servants... Um, is was going to end up inheriting everything he had. And God said, nope, you're going to have a child. You will have a son. Chapter 17, verse 16. Well, now Abram has been renamed into Abraham. And God is speaking with him about his wife. He says here, I will bless her and give you a son from her. Yes, I will bless her richly, and she will become the mother of many nations. Kings of nations will be among her descendants. So God is continuing these promises to the one that he now calls Abraham. So, 25 years go by. Now, you have to understand, um, Abraham had become a very old man, and his wife, Sarah, was now very, very old. So, let's see here in Genesis 21, 1 through 5. We had started back with the first promise, and now 25 years later, that promise is fulfilled. The Lord kept his word and did for Sarah exactly what he had promised. She became pregnant, and she gave birth to a son for Abraham in his old age. This happened at just the time God had said it would. And Abraham named their son Isaac. Eight days after Isaac was born, Abraham circumcised him as God had commanded. Abraham was 100 years old when Isaac was born. And uh, God, you know, fulfilled that promise to Abraham that from him a nation would come. And, you know, Abraham didn't see the complete fulfillment of all that in his lifetime, but he saw God's faithfulness and he believed God. And he saw the beginnings of that nation um, before, you know, he died. So God was faithful to him. Let's go to Genesis 22 and read 16 through 18. So then an angel came and spoke to Abraham. This is what the Lord says, because you have obeyed me and have not withheld even your son, your only son. I swear by my own name that I will certainly bless you. I will multiply your descendants beyond number like the stars in the sky and the sands on the seashore. Your descendants will conquer the cities of their enemies. And through your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed all because you have obeyed me. And so God is making a promise in his own name, the most powerful name that there could be, that this will come to fulfillment and that all the nations of the earth would be blessed through his descendants. And that's actually what happened. Because through um, this nation that God established from Abraham's descendants, we then eventually had the birth of the Messiah, the birth of Christ. And his birth, his life, his death and resurrection have truly brought hope and blessing to the whole world if people will just be open to it. But God has blessed the whole world through the nation that came from Abraham. So the word here that we see translated promise is the word epangelo. Isn't that beautiful? Epangelo. Reminds me of the word angel or something. It means to profess something, to engage, or to assert something about yourself. To announce what you're about to do, what your intention is. It's to render a service, to make a commitment or a pledge to do something. And so, Epangelo is God's assurance, that promise is God's assurance to Abraham that the land he showed him would be for him and for his descendants. So it's just, it's that this is my intent to do this. And then when God is speaking of how he will bless the nations, that word bless is from the word eulageo. Eulageo. Um, the word eulogy or to eulogize comes from it. Uh, the EU, the U means well or good. And logos is a speech or a word. So eulageo is to, to speak well of or to praise, extol. It has a meaning of blessing abundantly, 
to invoke a benediction, to give thanks. So this eulogio, eulogio could be from men to God, or from men to men, or from God to men. And um, this talks about that, you know, when God says he will bless the nations, um, when he blesses men, he grants them favor, and he will confer happiness upon them. That's all within the meaning of that word. So God's intent through this nation that was going to be coming from Abraham was to bless the world. And you know, um, there was a long wait for God to fulfill the promise of Abraham to have a son with his wife, Sarah. And we have to realize that just because time is really going by, that doesn't mean God isn't going to fulfill his promise. Um, we, we don't always know the very best timing, but God does. And I heard someone say something very wise one time, and, and I think we just need to realize that God, God always um, has the best answer for us when we ask him you know, for something, when we, when we need something from him. Um, and he will answer yes, or he'll answer no, or he might answer not yet. And sometimes the not yet is really hard on us to believe that God will bring it about, but it's not time yet. And even though Abraham waited 25 years, his not yet did actually um, absolutely come to pass. And of course, it was a miracle at that point because of the age of Abraham and Sarah. And now back in Hebrews 6, if we go to verses 16 and 17, it says here, Now when people take an oath, they call on someone greater than themselves to hold them to it. And without question, that oath is binding. God also bound himself with an oath, so that those who received the promise could be perfectly sure that he would never change his mind. Um, an oath, obviously... A covenant, an oath, um, is not going to mean anything unless there is some uh, something great to hold those involved in it accountable. All sorts of legal contracts and, and binding vows and oaths that we would make um, have a, an authority over that that will help make sure that it's taken seriously and that the people stick to their sides of the oath. And so God knew there was no one greater than himself, and he, he bound that oath in his own name. And so he would be upholding that oath. You know, he's the greatest power that is, and so we can know if he makes an oath, it's absolutely going to be fulfilled. He will do exactly what he said that he would do. Um, let's look in Psalm 110.4. Now, as we've gone through Hebrews, we've come back to this scripture, um, you know, fairly often. This whole chapter of 110 is so much messianic, so much about Jesus. And it says here in verse 4, The Lord has taken an oath, and he will not break his vow. He will not break his vow. And then speaking to Jesus, he's saying, You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And so God is saying, you know, um, there, they're just you know, speaking, say, I will keep my vows and then if we look in Hebrews 11, 8 through 10, we're going to be getting into Hebrews 11, you know, pretty soon here. But let's look at Hebrews 11, 8 through 10. It says, It was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and go to another land that God would give him as his inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going. And even when he reached the land God promised him, he lived there by faith. For he was like a foreigner living in tents. And so did Isaac and Jacob, who inherited the same promise. I love this next verse. In verse 10, it says, Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations, a city designed and built by God. And so, it, you know, God, God had promised this to Abraham, and he continued to have faith. Even when everything wasn't happening immediately, even when his sons, his son Isaac and later his grandson son Jacob were living there, but they were still believing in that same promise. They, they lived there by faith. And I love that. Abraham was looking forward to a city with eternal foundations. And God was blessed by the faith that they had. God was blessed by Abraham's faith. And then let's go ahead and look here. Um, at this passage that just touches me so much. We're going to go ahead now 
and read Hebrews 6, 18 and 19. So God has given both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable because it is impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. It leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. You know, an anchor is secure because of what it's fastened to. Um, it's fastened securely to the ship that's anchored there, and it's fastened securely into the earth beneath the water um, to hold um, that ship there. And we can know that this hope we have uh, in God's trustworthiness um, is anchoring our soul. We can be secure in that. I want to look at some really cool scriptures here. Numbers 23, 16 through 19. So this king, whose name was Balak, B-A-L-A-K, had wanted Balaam to, um, to curse the nation of Israel. Um, and God just simply would not allow it to happen. And so this is really cool here. Let's look in uh, chapter 23 at 16 through 19. The Lord met Balaam and gave him a message. And he said, go back to Balak, that's the king, and give him my message. So Balaam returned and found the king standing beside his burnt offerings with all the officials of Moab. What did the Lord say, Balak asked it eagerly. This was the message Balaam delivered. Rise up, Balak, and listen. Hear me, son of Zippor. God is not a man, so he does not lie. He is not human, so he does not change his mind. Has he ever spoken and failed to act? Has he ever promised and not carried it through? You know, God was, was determined that his people would receive a blessing, and he's not a man to lie. And I just, there, there are scriptures, as I've researched this and looked at this, there are scriptures that just talk about that God does not lie. 1 Samuel 15, 29. Samuel is talking to King Saul here, and he says, and he who is the glory of Israel will not lie, nor will he change his mind, for he is not human that he should change his mind. Let's go ahead now also and look at Titus back in the New Testament, Titus 1, verses 2 and 3. Now this is written by Paul to um, Titus. This truth gives them confidence that they have eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised them before the world began. And now at just the right time he has revealed this message which we announce to everyone. It is by the command of God our Savior that I have been entrusted with this work for him. So once again saying that God just does not lie. So as we look back here again in Hebrews 6 and in verse 18, toward the end of that verse is talking about that we can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. Just hold on to it. And if we go back to in Hebrews, Hebrews 3, 6, it says, but Christ as the Son is in charge of God's entire house. And we are God's house if we keep our courage and remain confident in our hope in Christ. Hold on to this hope that we have in Jesus. And then as we go to verse 19 of Hebrews 6, it talks here that this hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. It leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. Now, I want to go and talk just a little bit about that inner sanctuary. It's important that we understand the incredible meaning of this. So if we go back to Leviticus 16, and I want to read verses 2 and 3. Now, Aaron is the high priest, and previously a couple of his sons had gone in to offer an offering, and, and they came in very uh, flippantly, and they did not do it the way that they'd been taught or the way that God wanted them to, and they died. And so um, they had entered the Lord's presence and burned the wrong kind of fire before him. They were not taking it seriously. And so then in verse 2 of Leviticus 16, the Lord said to Moses, warn your brother Aaron 
not to enter the most holy place behind that inner curtain whenever he chooses. If he does, he will die. For the ark's cover, the place of atonement is there, and I myself am present in the cloud above the atonement cover. When Aaron enters the sanctuary area, he must follow these instructions fully. He must bring a young bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. And then it goes on to talk about how certain things have to be done in very specific ways so that they will truly take seriously the fact that they have the very incredibly holy presence of God himself in that inner sanctuary. It was not to be taken lightly. So if we stay in Leviticus 16 and we read 11 through 17, I want to just share just a few of the things that, that was required. Aaron will present his own bull as a sin offering to purify himself and his family, making them right with the Lord. After he has slaughtered the bull as a sin offering, he will fill an incense burner with burning coals from the altar that stands before the Lord. Then he will take two handfuls of fragrant powder incense and will carry the burner and the incense behind the inner curtain. There in the Lord's presence, he will put the incense on the burning coals so that a cloud of incense will rise over the ark's cover, the place of atonement that rests on the ark of the covenant. If he follows these instructions, he will not die. Then he must take some of the blood of the bull, dip his finger in it, and sprinkle it on the east side of the atonement cover. He must sprinkle blood seven times with his finger in front of the atonement cover. Then Aaron must slaughter the first goat as a sin offering for the people and carry its blood behind the inner curtain. There he will sprinkle the goat's blood over the atonement cover and in front of it, just as he did with the bull's blood. Through this process, he will purify the most holy place, and he will do the same for the entire tabernacle because of the defiling sin and rebellion of the Israelites. No one else is allowed inside the tabernacle when Aaron enters it for the purification ceremony in the most holy place. No one may enter it until he comes out again after purifying himself, his family, and all the congregation of Israel, making them right with the Lord. And so then, of course, it goes on with even more instructions, but this was to be taken so seriously. So what happened? Um, what happened that now it says here in Hebrews that this hope, this anchor, this hope we have in the Lord leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. This was a very seriously holy place, thick curtain. You didn't frivolously in any way, shape, or form go in there. But let's look at what God did. It was not man that did this. It was God. So let's go to Matthew 27 and read verses 50 and 51. Then Jesus, now he's being crucified right at this time. Then Jesus shouted out again and he released his spirit. And he has to, now he has died. At that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, rocks split apart. And then talks about many other things that happened during that time. But God ripped that curtain from the top to the bottom, open. Jesus, his sacrifice, what he did on that cross, opened the way for us to be able to be in the very presence of God. It was a tremendous, powerful symbol that God did there when that was ripped open. Um, it must have been so shocking to any priest there in the temple. But God was just saying, this, this lamb, my son that has been sacrificed, is now the final atonement. It doesn't have to be all these animal sacrifices and the blood brought in so carefully before me. Now the blood of my son has opened the way for man to get to me, for, my, for us to get to God himself. And so in Hebrews 6 here, at the end of verse 19, it leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. We are welcome with him. Um, we're going to go on in Hebrews just a little bit more here in Hebrews 9. Let's read 2 and 3. 
There were two rooms in that tabernacle. In the first room were a lampstand, a table, and, a sac and sacred loaves of bread on the table. This room was called the holy place. Then there was a curtain. And behind the curtain was a second room called the most holy place. And then we'll go ahead and I want to read now verses 7 and 8. But only the high priest ever entered the most holy place, and only once a year. And he always offered blood for his own sins and for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. By these regulations, the Holy Spirit revealed that the entrance to the most holy place was not freely open as long as the tabernacle and the system it represented were still in use. But after Jesus' sacrifice, that system no longer needed to be in use because Jesus was that final necessary sacrifice. The Holy of Holies was open. Oh my goodness, we, we've got to understand how incredibly powerfully significant that is. And so we can know that Jesus is there in the very presence of God the Father, seated at the right hand of the Father. The Bible says it over and over again. And this, this most holy place was the very presence of God, the very presence of God the Father. He, he was there with his people in that place. And so now we can know that his very presence is where Jesus is. And so, you know, verse 19 here is said that we've been led through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. And then in the final verse here in Hebrews 6, verse 20, it says, Jesus has already gone in there for us. He has become our eternal high priest in the order of Melchizedek. So he is there interceding for us. His blood provides our atonement, provides our forgiveness, and he is there in, in intercession for us. Um, God, it's incredible because God really sees us as righteous because of the blood of Jesus. He, he puts Jesus in the picture with us so that we can be considered righteous. You know, if we went back to Psalm 110, verse 4, it talks there about that Jesus would be a priest in the order of Melchizedek. I want to go back in Hebrews, just to Hebrews 4. We're going to read 14 through 16. Oh, these verses, oh, we just got to, that'd be a good thing to memorize too. But we have just got to take this in and believe it. What an incredible passage this is. So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God through that curtain torn wide open. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. What an incredible promise that is. How that is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls we can know we're welcome to go into his presence because of the presence of Jesus. And it is always okay to go to the Lord as his child. We should go with honesty. If we try to go playing games, he'll call us on it really fast. But if we can be honest and just spend time with him, we have mercy from him. We have what we need to help when we have times that we just really need to, to have him help us. He'll, he will. He'll give us the grace that we need. He'll give us the mercy that we need. Grace being given something we've never earned, but just are given in love and mercy being not given what we have earned, not receiving the, the just punishment because Jesus took that for us. I want to go to a beautiful scripture in Habakkuk. I want to read Habakkuk 2, 2 through 3. As we think about God saying that he, he will never lie, and we know he won't, and we can trust him, and we can cling to the promises that he has given us, and we can know that 
his yeses will be yes and his no's are given because it's wisdom. We should not get it. But his yeses will be yes. And sometimes they are not yet. But he will be faithful to his promises. And I love this scripture in Habakkuk. This will be the second chapter, verses 2 and 3. Then the Lord said to me, Write my answer plainly on tablets, so that a runner can carry the correct message to others. This vision is for a future time. It describes the end and it will be fulfilled. If it seems slow in coming, wait patiently, for it will surely take place. It will not be delayed. And sometimes the things that we, we want in our life that we know God has promised us seem like they take time to come, but it will not be delayed. It will not come any earlier than it should, and God knows in his wisdom if something would be too early. It will not come earlier than it should, but it will also not be late. It will come right when God knows is the best time for it to come. Just believe that vision and know that though we though it wait, we just we though it seems like it tarries, like it seems like it's taking time to come, we will wait patiently knowing that God cannot lie. He doesn't lie, and he will be faithful to his promises in our life. Let's pray. Dear Father God, thank you that you are holy and good and trustworthy, and we can believe what you say to us because you do not lie. And Lord, we can know that what you have wanted in our lives has been coming from love Thank you. Thank you that, that even way back when you were talking to Abram, you were promising him that someday the whole world would be blessed. And Abraham, was, he believed you, Lord, and you have blessed the whole world. God, I just pray that we can share this wonderful truth, that we can be bold and we can be a light in this very dark world. Because the salvation that you brought, Jesus, is the hope that this world, the only hope that this world has. And I pray it can be an anchor for all of us as we trust you, Lord. Please help us to be bold in proclaiming your truth. The world's trying to call the whole, the whole thing about you, Jesus, as being something to joke about. Or, or students of mine, Lord, being taught that the name of Jesus is a cuss word. Oh, God, I'm so... I'm so sorry about that. I, the enemy is deceiving people so badly because, Jesus, you are the hope. You're a king of kings. You are the Lord. You are a high priest. You are loving, and you have given everything for us. Lord, we need to be able to have a heart open to give you anything, anything you could ever want. We belong to you. So, Lord, just... Bring healing, and I pray all the time that you will help people to be reconciled to each other and, and forgiving. There are those that are lonely. They're just always on my heart, Lord, and I pray that you will just bring your presence so strongly to them and bring people into their lives too, Lord, that can be there for them. Lord, we just pray that your perfect will be done, and we know that it's your perfect timing. We believe you for that. Help us to just live that way. Live in that faith and that belief. Thank you again, Lord, for your word. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I've loved Hebrews, but boy, now that I'm digging into it as much as I am for this study, I'm so blessed by it. And um, I just pray that this time in the word will be a blessing for you too. Um, our church services stream at 11 o'clock um, every Sunday Eastern time, and we'd love to have you join us. Um, there'll be interaction at that time, but then it'll also be on YouTube um, later on. It's on YouTube and Facebook, but it'll be later on. Um, you know, please find people to worship with. But if if you'd like to come and just share that time with us um, online, that would be neat. That'd be wonderful. At the end screen, there's an orange circle with arrows. And there's a link in the description below, both of which can take you to the YouTube channel to watch the service. So, all right, I love you guys. We'll be into Hebrews 7 next week. 
and we're going to really learn more about um, Abraham and, and uh, more about Melchizedek, and it's pretty cool. <laughs> All right, I love you guys. I'll see you later. Okay, bye-bye.